10 second countdown. This says I'm live. Oh, it is live already. Okay. <laughs> Welcome to the 67th episode of the Flip Learning Network podcast. I'm your host, Roy Cockrum. The Flip Learning Network podcast is presented by the EdReach Network, giving educators a voice, a big voice. This EdReach podcast is supported by Audible.com, the Internet's leading provider of audiobooks with more than 150,000 downloadable titles across all types of literature, including fiction, nonfiction, and periodicals. For a free audiobook of your choice, go to audio, audiblepodcast.com slash EdReach. That's audiblepodcast.com slash EdReach. Today, Joan Brown is joining me as co-host, and on the show today we have Todd Neslany. He is a fifth grade teacher from Texas and also one of the co-authors of Flipping 2.0. Todd, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here and get to talk with you all. Would you like to tell us a little bit more about yourself? Um, well, like you said, I teach fifth grade math. Um, I teach at Fieldster Elementary in Waller, Texas, a little old town in Texas um, near Houston. Um, and uh, this is my seventh year of teaching, and I am doing my second year of a flipped and project-based classroom. And so um, we've had Lisa Highfill and Delia Bush on the show um, previously, but there aren't a lot of elementary flippers. Um, tell us a little bit about your experience as becoming an elementary flipper. Um, well, the student population that I teach with is a very um, has a lot of challenges to flipping, and so that's why um, I try to talk as much as I can about how we flip. Because 50% uh, of my students don't have internet at home, they are 66% free and reduced lunch, um, and so we are not one to one. We do not have a lot of technology money in our district, so we have had to be creative in the ways that we find to make the flip classroom work. Um, so uh, we did get a grant about halfway through my first year um, that helped us uh, uh, reach some of the kids. Um, but before that, uh, we were ha we were doing all kinds of things to make sure that we could make this work. And it was a lot of work on my end, um, but I'm one of those that if I'm passionate about it, I'm going to put the work in and however much work is needed to make sure that it's, it's as successful as possible. And we had a lot of um, success this last year, so much so that my entire fifth grade team is now flipped and project based. And, and how long have you personally been flipping? This is the my second year. Second year. So I did it all last year and I've done it since the first day of school this year. And do you just teach math or do you teach other subjects as well? Um, I, I, I'm primarily responsible for math. Um, I teach a little bit of social studies and a little bit of writing. Um, but it's very complicated to explain how my team splits that up because um, we all kind of teach a little bit of social studies and writing, but it's it's weird. We're trying a, a whole brand new schedule this year with that so we can cover those subjects more in-depthly without having one person have a double load on them. Um, and so initially, what are the biggest things you felt like you needed to overcome uh, flipping an elementary class? Well, the first way was figuring out how to get the kids access to the videos um, if they didn't have internet at home. Um, because my first op my first line of defense was internet. And even when using internet, I made sure to put the videos in uh, four different locations. And I did that for a particular reason. And the reason is, and I always tell people this, is you will never walk into a room full of adults and have all of them on the same device. And so I think it's crazy when you walk into a classroom and you hear a teacher say, everybody has to use this tool or everybody has to use this website. Well, that's not real world, and you're going to lose some kids like that. And so when I was putting my videos online, I didn't just want them in one location because I knew that there were going to be students who were uncomfortable at that location, and that was going to turn them off, or parents who didn't like that place that I was putting them, or there would be a lot of excuses of, I forgot my password, or the website was down, or this or that or this. And so I've put them in several locations to bypass that. And so now the kids have no excuses on why they can't watch their videos. So we put them on YouTube. Um, but again, I teach fifth grade. YouTube still has that stigma attached, which was another reason why I didn't just want YouTube, because I didn't want any parents to say, I can't believe you're sending my kid to this place. And so I just didn't want to fight that battle. But I wanted my videos on YouTube to share with other educators as well. Um, we utilize Sophia, 
a lot, um, sophia.org. That tends to be my students' favorite location to get their flip class uh, materials because of the fact that Sophia allows me to build playlists and tutorials where I can embed PDF documents, Google Forms, uh, PowerPoints, all that right on the same page as the video. And so my students like it when they don't have to click a ton of links to do all the extra things that may come with the video. And so we also put videos on iTunes U. And, you know, that's one of the ways that I was able to get some of those kids who didn't have internet at home. We are a BYOD campus, bring your own device. And so some of my students, I always find it funny how those kids who can't afford lunch um, come to school smelling like they haven't taken a shower in a week and have holes in their shoes. Their parents always tend to buy the nicest cars, the nicest phones, and the newest game systems and gadgets for their kids, but they can't ever afford lunch or clothes. And so um, a lot of my students who maybe don't have a ton of resources have an iPod Touch or an iPhone or some other iDevice. And so they're able to bring those to school, get on our Wi-Fi, and with the iTunes U app, they can download the video um, directly to their device. So that way when they go home, they don't need internet to access the video any longer. The video is already on their device from using the internet at school. And um, we also use Edmodo, uh, but I don't put the videos on Edmodo per se because Edmodo doesn't allow you to house your videos in-house yet, that you can embed YouTube and SchoolTube and all those kind of things. Um, but Edmodo tends to be our central communication hub. And so when the kids are confused about where something was or need to get in contact with me, that's when they utilize Edmodo. Um, but for those kids who don't have internet at home, my first line of defense, like I said, is internet. Some of my kids... Um, have computers even though they don't have internet so they bring a flash drive and flash drives are now becoming part of our school supply list as well so that every kid will have one of those as part of their school supplies um, uh, and then if they don't have a computer many of them have a game system that plays DVDs or a DVD player and so I burn DVDs and I did have to have the conversation with my students because some of them said oh well I don't have a DVD player and I said, oh, really? Because you were talking about Call of Duty last week, and that's on Xbox 360, and that plays DVDs. And they'll say, oh, yeah, well, it plays DVDs, but it's not a DVD player. And I have to tell the kids, yes, that's still a DVD player, even though it's a game system. And so um, I burn DVDs as well. That is a nightmare, and I hate doing it, and it's a lot of work. But like I said earlier, you got to do what you got to do sometimes to make the process work. And so burning the DVDs um, was good. Last year was my first year flipping, and flipping is a lot of work your first year. And I was making two or three videos at a time, and so I was burning rewritable DVDs. So that way the kids could bring the DVD home with three videos on it, bring it back to school. I would reburn it and then send it back home with them. This year, since it's my second year of flipping, I'm able to just hand them a DVD the first day with all the videos on it. And so that's been nice to have that. Um, if they didn't have a DVD player, because two of my 75 students last year did not have a DVD player, um, we had a class set of iPod Nanos for the school. And so I checked out Nanos to those kids, um, and they could take those. Some, the screens were tiny, and the devices are tiny. But, like I said, it's, it's what we got to do to make it work, and that's what we had to do. And, you know, a, a lot of people have said, I can't believe you were sending that technology home with the kids and that you trusted them. And you know what? When you set expectations that are clear and you allow kids the technology that they want in the classroom anyway, and you say, you know what? Mess this technology up, and it's going away. They take a lot better care of it. And so the kids took really good care of the technology that was sent out with them. They never lost, broken, nothing was stolen or scratched, um, and they always brought it back. And so it was a really good resource. Now, I did have one student whose parents said, I don't want my kid bringing a nano home because if it costs over $10 and she loses it, I'm not paying for it. And, you know, one thing that um, is really characteristic of me is I am very honest and blunt with parents. Um, I, I stand up for what I believe is right for what I'm doing for my classroom as long as I'm within the handbook and the state law. And so my principal really supports that. And so I told that parent flat out, I said, look, I said, I tried to provide you with internet, a flash drive, a DVD player, and even my own technology. And none of that worked for you or you didn't want any of that. I said, so now it's your turn to step up as a parent and meet me halfway. And you're going to need to bring your kid right before school or let have her stay right after school to get those videos done. And I told her, I said, you know, my videos are never longer than 10 minutes. 
Most of them average five to six minutes. And so I don't think it's a big deal for me to ask you to bring your kids 15 minutes early to school or have her stay 15 minutes after because my videos are like two or three nights a week max. I mean, some weeks we only watch one a week. And so it wasn't a big deal. And she said, you know what? You're right. I can make that sacrifice and I'll make sure that she's there. And so that's the, the, the internet is always the biggest challenge for districts that aren't one-to-one. -one. If you're a one-to-one -one district, you've got it made. It's easy. Um, but for those of us like mine that aren't, we've had to be uh, creative in the way that we uh, try to reach the students' needs. Hey, Todd. I am so uh, impressed with the fact that you have crossed every T and dotted every I. I read your parent letter. And you even went so far as to explain what's going to happen if the student doesn't watch the video. Can you kind of elaborate on that a little bit, too? Well, you know, one thing I heard about from other teachers that were flipping is that was one of their biggest issues, was how do we deal with these kids that aren't watching the videos? And um, I think with elementary, it's a little bit easier to deal with that because they still have that fear and they still want to please. Whereas when you get in junior high and high school, they're like, screw you, I'm going to do whatever I want to do. And so um, with the elementary kids, you know, I really wanted to teach them consequences, but not you're in trouble, go to the principal's office consequences. And so when you come to my class and you don't watch a video or you don't do the assignment that goes with the video, um, you have to go get out at the back of the room and get on some kind of device or computer or something and watch the video. And then I'm going to hand you a stack of worksheets that cover the same concept that we're learning about that day. And you're going to do that in the back of the room while the rest of us are doing a project-based, hands-on, inquiry-based learning activity. And I'm leaving them in the room because I want them to see what they're missing. And, you know, um, some teachers said, well, I've tried to do that and it didn't work. And I think that what works for me is that I try to make my class as fun and active and interactive as possible. And so when you make your class like that and the students have to sit in the back of the room and watch their peers do this great fun stuff and create these things, they're like, well, I, I want to do that too. And I tell them, you know what, then do your work. And I've never had a parent complain. And if they did, what I would tell them is, you know, for five years, that's all I taught was worksheets. And that's why I moved to this model. And nobody ever had an issue with me teaching worksheets before. And so why is it an issue that one day I have your child do worksheets? If you don't want them doing worksheets, help me make them do their videos. And so um, it's really been good. I have an average of three to five students um, that uh, per video that don't watch it. And it's for a multitude of reasons. Sometimes it's a, I forgot, I didn't feel like it. And then sometimes there's those kids who say, because um, this is very... Uh, very uh, true of my population is students will say, well, you know, mom and dad got in a fight last night and we had to go stay at a hotel and I left my device on my bed and we couldn't watch it. And I have to tell them, you know, I'm really sorry. Let's think of some ways we can be better prepared if that happens again. But you still have the same consequence because your bus got here early and you didn't come in and watch the video. You didn't skip your recess. You didn't try to stay after school. You didn't come and talk to me until after I'd already signed the consequence. And, I, and, and I've gotten some flack from some teachers for treating those kind of kids' stories the same ways as the other ones. But I really want those students to see that they cannot let their situations define them and allow them to make excuses for who they are. They have to realize that they have to figure out a way to live within that situation and be successful regardless of what their circumstances are. And I do it in a very loving way. I'm not mean or rude about it, but I let them know that, hey, I'm sorry that happened, but you still have consequences. Because in the real world, for real jobs, you're still going to have consequences when you don't meet deadlines and you don't do things when they're supposed to be done. Well, and Todd's mentioned uh, several uh, tools that he uses, and one great tool for... Flip Classrooms will be Audible.com. This HeadReach podcast is supported by Audible.com, the Internet's leading provider of audiobooks with more than 150,000 downloadable titles, including some great educational choices. For our listeners, Audible is offering a free audiobook to give you a chance to try out their service. One audiobook to consider is one of my favorites. It's called I'd Like to Apologize to Every Teacher I Ever Had. And it's by Tony Danza. Um, it is about his time. He actually, most people don't realize, got a degree in teaching before he went into acting. Um, and a few years back, he got uh, a job as a part-time English teacher at a high school in Philadelphia. And the book is about his um, 
the problems he had trying to be a teacher. So for a free audiobook of your choice, go to audiblepodcast.com slash edreach. That's audiblepodcast.com slash edreach. Um, so Todd, um, you mentioned a little bit, or you talked a lot about uh, one of the problems, my school is a K to 8, and I teach 7th and 8th. And when I encounter fifth graders in different activities, or like I direct our musical that we let fifth graders in, is person they they don't have a sense of personal responsibility yet. A lot of them they expect everything to be sent home to their parents. They don't expect to have to be responsible to take things home to their parents and things like that. Um, how how long does it take you to kind of instill that personal responsibility needed for a successful flip class? Well, you know, for some kids, it's it, I mean, it's different for every kid. Uh, last year, it was. Uh, I didn't feel successful in my model of teaching with the flip class in project-based learning until about six months end of the year. And I say that because there were certain markers in my students that I was looking for to feel successful in what I was doing. I wanted to see a deeper understanding. I wanted to see better conversation skills about my subject area. I wanted to see creativity. I wanted to see things that were more than just a standardized test um, because previously for five years, my five years before doing this, I had excellent test scores. I had 100% passing with 75% commended my fifth year of teaching. And so I knew what I was doing, but I knew how to teach a test. And so I knew the strategies to teach to get my kids to be successful. That I did not know how to teach them the subject. I knew how to teach them a test. And so one thing I really wanted to prove to myself when flipping was that I could get these kids to understand a test without – or understand a subject without ever mentioning a test. Um, from October until our state test in April, we did not do one test formatted question. We did not do one worksheet. Um, I wanted to prove that through inquiry-based learning um, and through hands-on and creation and getting messy, we could still be successful on a standardized test without ever having to see those stupid questions that we all think we have to do. And it was terrifying. And for about six months, I thought, oh, my gosh, I'm going to lose my job because these kids are going to fail this test. They're not thinking the way I want them to think. Maybe I need to go back and teach this test because how am I going to get these results? Because if I don't get these results, my district's going to be all over me, regardless of how much growth my students had. And so about six months in, we did, a, we did what, what I called a math fair. Um, and that was the first time I saw true creativity, um, the first time I've ever seen pride in my students about their learning. Um, and that's when everything I went, okay, I've got this. My kids are with me. They are um, doing this. And so you asked about building that responsibility. And last year was different. This year, I have a, I mean, my kids are like polar opposites this year. Last year, my kids had no creativity but tons of common sense. This year, I have the most creative kids I've ever had, but there is zero common sense and it is driving me insane. Um, but it, I mean, it just, it takes a while, but I'm very strict with my kids. I'm very much, you will do this, and there will be no excuse. My, if you ever come visit my class, the first thing my kids will tell you is he always says no excuses. Because you know what? There aren't any excuses. Figure out a way to make it work. Figure out a way to make it happen. I'm not here to listen to your excuse. I'm here to help you be successful. And the only way that's going to happen is if you step it up and put the work in. Because I can only do 50%. You have to do the other 50%. And, you know, it was funny because uh, we took our first uh, district exam. There's five elementaries in my district. And uh, that's one really good thing when we take district exams. I can really have good comparative data to the schools who aren't flipping to see where I'm missing holes with what I'm doing. And so um, we took our first district exam. And I've always been in first or second place out of the five schools. Well, we were in last place this year. Um, and this was the first year that I started from the first day of school with no uh, test formatted questions and no worksheets. And we were at 37% passing on our first exam. I was devastated. I was upset. I was disappointed. And I went and did just a lot of self-evaluation. And you know, the first six weeks of the school year, it was a really difficult time for me professionally. Um, there were lots of different battles I was fighting and 
fires I was having to put out and issues like that. And I just wasn't as emotionally present as I should have been for my students. And so when doing the evaluation, I realized, you know what? I did too much sitting back. I did too much pulling myself away. And, and, it, and it hurt my kids because I wasn't as actively involved with their learning as I could have been. And um, I, I met with them as soon as we took the test and finished it and got the results. I met with them and I said, look, guys, I said, I need to apologize to y'all. I said, I haven't been here like I should have been. That's why our scores are the way we are. But you know what? I've seen my mistake. I'm here now. And we're going to step up together and we're going to work on this together and be successful together. And, you know, we took our, our other exam last week and we scored back at the second highest um, and jumped 50 points um, from our last exam. And so I think that I tell that story because I think the teacher plays a really big part. Um, if you are not actively involved in your students' learning, um, if you are not passionate about what you're doing and bringing that passion into your class, your students aren't going to be passionate either. Um, when teachers tell me that, well, my students are really well, are really uh, misbehaving, and I can't get them focused, and I have a really crazy group this year, I hate to say it, but it's your fault. If your kids are misbehaving in class, they're bored. If your kids aren't paying attention, it's your lesson, and and that's a tough thing for a lot of teachers to hear, especially teachers that have been doing it a while, because we think that what we've been, well, it was good last year. Well, yeah, your kids change every year. And maybe this year, you're not as present like me as I was last year. And so I think teachers have to realize um, the biggest thing that I've learned is that, you know, we place way too much blame on the students. We place way too much blame on their backgrounds. And we place way too much blame on their parents. Um, I think we've missed a big key component, which is us, the teachers. Um, we really have to step up our game. And that doesn't necessarily mean making everything all technology. I, I'm a tech ninja. I love technology. Uh, but, you know, there's some days when we don't, we don't need technology. The lesson doesn't have to be this crazy technological lesson to get their attention. It's just got to be fun. And when my kids see me being crazy and me having fun, it builds a love of that learning in them. And they want to please me because they're like, dang, he really likes this stuff. Well, what? I want to like it too. And so that's really helped um, reach my kids and have them want to be successful because they want to please me um, because I constantly tell them, you know, guys, you're going to – the only way you will ever be successful is if you step up because they have been taught so long that we will modify everything and we will IEP everything and we will do everything we need to get them to pass. And I tell them, you know what, I'll meet these mods that we have in place, but if you don't need it, we're going to have an R and we're going to cancel them because you are not going to be babied in my class because when you get to college, they're not going to baby you there and all of you will go to college um, or go to a trade school, one of the two. Um, so I really push that and try to inspire them that way. Todd, I feel like I'm supposed to say amen. <laughs> <laughs> that's really, well, I guess that's a good thing. It is. No, you are fantastic. Um, and then I, I just want to be sure our listeners know that, that you do have uh, some of this stuff out on YouTube. And one of the things that you have is an interview with your class. You want to tell me a little bit about uh, what prompted you to interview the students about their best parts of the year? Well, you know, uh, I always tell people, people ask about the technology we use and how I get parents on board and teachers on board and what do I do with this. And your biggest set are your students. Um, I have students train their parents on the technology we use. I have students train other teachers. Um, when teachers, I'm not the campus technologist, but I have too many teachers call down to my room to ask me tech questions. And, um, and I, if, I can't, if I don't have time to go and fix them for them, I'll send a kid down to their room and say, hey, you know how to do this, right? Okay, go show this teacher how to fix this. Because there's power in an adult seeing a kid do it, but it also empowers the students. And one thing that's really big about my classroom is I try as hard as I can to give my students a voice. I want them to feel like their opinions matter and that we are not in a dictatorship classroom. We are in a collaborative classroom. And they're never going to believe that until you give validity to their voice. And so when we do projects, there are sometimes when I sit down with my kids and say, guys, we're learning about this next. I have no idea what I want to do yet. What kind of ways do you all want to learn about this? Do you have any ideas of stuff we could do? 
And so they come up with stuff and give me ideas. And so as I went and started uh, getting some notoriety for the things that we were doing with the flip classroom, um, people always wanted to say, you know, I want to come watch your class or I want to see your kids in action, but I can't, you're too far away or da 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 da. And I thought, well, what I can do is allow my kids to speak for me. And so I chose nine of my students um, from I chose I chose every different ethnic background we had represented in our grade, and I chose every um, socioeconomic status and every ability level. I want it to be a well-rounded group. Um, I just I got the special permission slip signed because yes, it's on YouTube and it shows their faces and they say their names, and so I had to get special stuff signed. Um, but um, I interviewed them for 45 minutes. I didn't tell them any questions ahead of time. If you watch the video, it's only 20 minutes long. Um, that is because uh, I did a lot of editing because there was it's fifth graders. I didn't give them the questions ahead of time, so there was a lot of ums and I don't know or what. <laughs> and I was like, oh, we can't look ignorant. I'm gonna have to piece this together. Um, and so uh, we did it in one take. Um, but it took 45 minutes, and rather than re-record the whole thing, I was like, I'll just edit it. Um, it is kind of hard to hear because we're not a professional recording studio, and I didn't realize that until afterwards. But if you listen with headphones, it's much easier to hear. Um, but I will tell you that we did that in May of uh, this past school year, and I've used it all summer at all my trainings, and I talk about it everywhere I go. And um, I've had several of the students in the video come back to me this school year, and they're like, how many hits does our video have, and where did you show it now? Because they love the fact that they're getting, that they know that I'm showing it. Um, and also, uh, my students have their own YouTube channel, where we put, I put videos up that they're creating. Um, they have, I think, six videos about some websites that we use and then there's a couple instructional videos they created um, but they are obsessed with the view count they are obsessed with comments um, and that's one thing that I always tell people um, when we do projects in my class they ask how I get people to buy in or get kids to the buy in and do good results we share everything that they make because the one main difference between the current generation and our generation our generation we want positive feedback from people we know and respect the current generation, they don't care who they get the feedback from. They want it from somebody. They want somebody to like it. They want somebody to favorite it. They want somebody to share it. And so when you put their finished products online, um, you get them to make a much better finished product because they know random strangers are going to be looking at it, and they care so much about the random strangers. And so we put everything online, and it's been awesome seeing the feedback. Um, especially from some of the companies that my kids have made videos um, teaching how to use their websites. Some of those companies now have my kids' videos on their websites, which is a, a huge um, boost to my students to feel like, again, they have a voice that matters. Well, I think, too, you get an opportunity to teach them how to use uh, social media and different online tools. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm regularly encouraging our younger grade teachers to start teaching their kids these things because they've done a lot of the things they shouldn't be doing by the time they get to me in seventh grade and and, and I'm having to break habits and I, I you know I I, I tell um, we came to a realization a couple of weeks or a few weeks back my several people on my staff did is that kids think everything public is still private and yep. adults think everything private is still public <laughs> And so we have to find that balance that they understand what really is public and what really is private and what we want out there and what we can take back and what we can't take back. And, uh, and you know, I teach my kids a lot about social media as well. Um, even though my kids aren't technically of age mm -hmm. to have social media accounts, many of them do, not surprisingly. Right. Um, but um, we have a class Twitter account. Um, my students do not have their own Twitter accounts. I don't get involved in any of that mess, so just let me make that clear. Um, but we do have a class Twitter account. Now, Twitter's blocked in our district, but um, I'm active on Twitter, and I wanted my kids to see the power in it. And so we have a class account, and every day a student will come to me and say, hey, I want to tweet this out that I learned this today, or can I take a picture of this thing I made and tweet it out? And I hand them my phone. They type in the tweet on our account. They hand the phone back to me, and I read it again to make sure we don't look ignorant because um, we are from Texas. We already have that stipulation that we ride <laughs> horses to school every day. And so um, then I tweet it out. 
And, and some people said, well, your kids aren't tweeting every day. And I said, that's right. If my students don't come to me to ask me to tweet something, we don't tweet that day. And so that's been a great way to uh, teach them how to connect, um, but in a safe environment. I'm still in control, um, but they're still being able to connect and share. And, you know, the funniest story is that I always tell people is, you know, kids are so much smarter than us with technology tools. We all know that. Um, like, I learned how to use Prezi. Love it. Took me like an hour and a half to make my first Prezi. My students wanted to use Prezi, and I said, I don't have time to teach you. You can go learn it yourself. Here's my account. Log in with my stuff and just use my account. They had a Prezi made in less than 15 minutes, and it was more amazing than mine that I spent an hour and a half on. And I was like, what the heck? How did you figure that out so fast? And they're like, it's easy. And so I'm like, yeah, of course you would say that. And so as soon as they made it, they're like, hey, can we tweet this out, our Prezi? And I said, sure, and make sure that we'll tag Prezi in the tweet so that the company can see it too. Prezi responded back in five minutes that they thought it was amazing that the kids had made this. You would have thought the President of the United States had tweeted my students back. They were flipping out. They took my phone to go show the principal because they wanted her to see it. This company noticed something they made. I mean, it was hilarious. But yet again, another power of connecting. I, I can't even express. I mean, that's like authentic education so to the, to the ultimate because it's instantaneous. Right. Fantastic. Are you worried about... Um, I mean, I know you were saying early on you were talking about uh, laws and, and rules. Now, do you keep really careful track of, of the names that you're using and, and trying to protect those students in some way? Anything that goes online that is done by my students, you will never see their face, and they always use a code name, which to them is way more fun than using their real name anyway. <laughs> Great. And so that's the way we protect ourselves there. Um, I could get form signs and all this, but I don't feel like jumping through those hoops. I teach in a very traditional district who um, it makes them nervous that I even put a kid's voice online. And so I figured rather than fighting any battles, we'll just keep it where it's just their voice, um, and it will never be anything more, and they will never use their real names besides that one interview I did with my students. Right. Good. Um, so, Todd, where can the listeners find you? Where, where's your blog? What's your Twitter handle? Things like that. Well, um, everything that I have dealing with my classroom is all on my website, um, and that's toddnesloney.com, T-O-D-D-N-E-S-L-O-N-E-Y.com. Um, I've got some webinars that I've done with Sophia about the flipped classroom that people can watch if they need more information. Um, I've got the video with my students. I have my parent letter. I have all kinds of resources um, of things for our classroom. In addition to my blog, is also linked on um, my web page. Um, and I try to write every single week about things we're doing. Um, and I'm trying to be very honest uh, about the failures and the successes because if all we do is talk about success, nobody's ever going to learn. Um, because I only learn from my failures. I don't learn from the great things I'm doing. How is that teaching me anything? Um, but I, I talk about both. Um, people can find me on Twitter. I'm Tech Ninja Todd. Um, I'm very active on Twitter. Um, I know some people try to email me questions, and it takes me a couple days to email back. But if you tweet me, I'll respond back in five or ten minutes usually. Um, so I'm pretty active there. Um, but all, I'm active on a bunch of different social media sites. But if you go to my webpage, at the bottom of my webpage, there's all the buttons to all the social media sites that I'm active on. Um, so you can click on any of those, including my YouTube channel, which I have all my videos on. So you can go see any of those that you may want to see. All that's at the bottom of my webpage. And and you, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead, John. I, I was just going to say, um, the uh, YouTube channel that your students do, is that also connected somewhere? Yes, if you go to the flipped classroom page on my website, at the very bottom underneath my student interview, in real big writing, it says click here to see the YouTube page that my students uh, do. Because we have two different YouTube pages, one with my instructional flipped class videos and one with my, my students. So my instructional videos is at the bottom of every one of my web pages, but my students one is on our flipped classroom page on my website. Okay, thanks. Well, thanks, Todd, for your time. Your uh, experiences, I'm sure, are very valuable for our listeners. Well, I, I really appreciate the offer of even coming on here. It's, it was, it was uh, awesome. I had a great time, so I love talking with you all. Well, and I've gotten a lot of people that have said they, they, they 
want that you have a lot to say. <laughs> we 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 saw that. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, in a good way. I mean, they just say a lot of people said. Talk with uh, Tech Ninja Todd. He he's he's got a lot of good things to say. So. Well, I hope I had some good morsels in there somewhere. So. Most definitely. <laughs> well, thanks again. Mm -hmm. Hey, I wish you luck on your keynote tomorrow too. You want to tell thanks. everyone where you are right now? Yeah, I am in Williamsburg, Virginia, quite a distance from Texas. Um, this is my first time along the East Coast, besides Florida. I don't really count that. That's different. Um, but, yeah, this is my first time on the East Coast, and so it's it's beautiful driving through and seeing all the trees. I was like, oh, this is wonderful. And then I get out of the car, and it's cold. And I'm like, mm, mm, I, don't, I don't like the cold. I want to be back in Texas. Um, but, yeah, I'm at the Educational Technology Leadership Conference here in Williamsburg, um, and I'm going to be their keynote in the morning at 9 a.m. And so this is my, my first outside of Texas anything. And so I'm pretty excited, but also super nervous at the same time because I don't want to let anybody down. Um, but my keynote's all about being a connected educator and the value that lies in connecting and learning from others. So I'm pretty pumped. Well, good luck. I'm sure Thank it'll you. be wonderful. Thank you. All right.